All right, so let's get started. Today's topic uh, of the Write Workshop June 2020 is, Oh, I have an idea. Now we've all been there. You have a brilliant idea for a story, you know, one that, you know, at least in your mind, that can match some of the best novels you've read or the best movies you've watched. So you get really excited, open up your laptop or maybe an old fashioned writing pad and start writing and things just don't seem to go quite right. You know, there's something missing in the writing and then you realize maybe you don't know your story as well as you thought you would. Well, that's perfectly fine uh, because there's a huge chain of process between the moment you have that idea to the moment you start writing. So today in this program, I'm going to lead you through a step-by-step -step process to uh, help you flesh out your story. Now, again, this is just one of the many models for a creation. You know, different authors will tell you different things. So if you already have a working method for yourself, don't feel like you have to scratch them all off. Uh, just see this one as another helpful suggestion, which you can incorporate into your workflow. So let's start with this short exercise. You know, you hopefully you came here with a story uh, or, you know, you have an idea of what you want to write about. So I want you to summarize your story for me. Uh, but here's the catch. You only have 15 seconds to do it. And as you can see, I have this uh, little, uh, little circle to the bottom right. I, I spend a lot of time animating that thing uh, and it will count down 15 seconds for you and then it will flash towards the end. So when I click start, you will, uh, you know, just uh, summarize your story. You can speak it out loud or you can, you know, think about it out loud in your mind. Just don't think of it in vague terms. Imagine that you suddenly got into an elevator with this famous producer or editor and you only have that much time before the elevator opens before you pitch that idea to them all right so i'm going to click start three two one go Oh, that went by really fast. Oh my goodness. Now, I think some of you uh, probably did really well. Uh, you know, you can condense your story into one succinct statement. And some of you didn't do as well. Maybe you stumbled a little bit. You have to think about what's the best way of summarizing it. And that's okay too. That's why we're here. Uh, if you particularly struggle, you may want to pay close attention to the next few slides. Again, this part is very crucial to you. Uh, when you're submitting your uh, story for publishing or for producing, this, the line that you're trying to say just now will be called a log line. That's the thing that producer and editors see uh, to find out whether your story has any value. Now, let me introduce you to this term, high concept. Now, high concept is a uh, type of artistic work that can be easily pitched with a succinctly stated premise. Now, it's not, it's not necessarily, uh, you know, uh, the only way to pitch a story. Uh, and sometimes it may not have as much of an artistic value, but it's definitely an easier one to execute. It may sacrifice in nuanced character development, but it does gain strong symbolism, theme, and excitement. And in a moment, I'm going to show you some examples of this. So uh, don't worry, we'll come back to this. But before I do that, we have a, a high concept. So naturally, we also have low concepts. Right? Low concept stories are a lot harder to explain. Uh, you know, they may have many intricate plots and subplots, many intertwined themes and complex, complex characters. You know, if you think about Pride and Prejudice, uh, or even something like Moby Dick, uh, you know, the, there are so many layers to that story that if I ask you to explain that in one sentence, it simply cannot be done. Uh, 
Today in our program, we are going to use a high concept as our example, just because it's easier to do. Uh, but let me emphasize that one more time, uh, high concept stories are not the only way to create good stories. It's just for my instructional purposes. In fact, high concepts and low concepts are not necessarily exclusive. Christopher Nolan's movie, uh, you know, Inception, for instance, they often incorporate both high concept and low concept. You know, if you look at the high concept of Inception, it will be about, you know, a bunch of thieves trying to get into the CEO's dreams uh, and implant a story, uh, implant an idea in his brain. Uh, but the action movie is much more than that. There's a lot more nuanced character development and complex pro uh, plot lines. High concept does not necessarily mean commercial or superficial. Let's take a look at a few examples here, and you may be able to guess what they are. A guy went back in time and met his parents, but his mother fell in love with him. It's back to the future. In fact, this very sentence is the seed of that movie when the, the writer came up with the story. Literally everything about that movie came from this sentence. Scientists resurrected dinosaurs and put them in a park open to tourists. It should be a pretty easy one. This one right here is not as well known. Private tech company specializes in granting people's dying wishes by altering their memories. This one's from this indie game called To the Moon, one of my personal favorites. Uh, basically, you know, when people are on their deathbed, they may contact this company to fulfill their wish, but because they are dying soon, uh, the company cannot, you know, they can't alter the past or anything. They just simply go to their brains and create a false memory for them. And To the Moon is a really great story, very emotional, uh, symbolic. If you have the chance, uh, definitely take a look. All right. So what should a good concept or a good idea have? You know, remember this is the seed of the story. How can we design this concept so that we have the most value to work from? Well, we've condensed the, the idea into four components. You can remember them as the two C's and two S's, conflict, character, story, and subtext. Now, in fact, in a way, we may even be able to condense them to only two components, which is conflict and character, right? You know, we always have that debate about, you know, whether character or story, which one, uh, uh, you know, plot and character, which one should uh, be the more important part in the story. Uh, but if we condense them into just conflict and character, this idea may seem a little bit too uh, academic, a little bit too rigid, uh, seems to take the human part out of it and, you know, make it all about theories. And if we're doing creative writing, a, a, th a, a theory that's too tight may not be helpful to us in the creative process. So we want to focus on story and subtext as well. Storytelling is arguably one of the natural talents of human beings. There's a theory that uh, the Homo sapiens sapiens uh, eventually came on top over the Neanderthals uh, because human, uh, the Homo sapiens sapiens, us humans, had the ability to tell stories. You know, they gather around bonfires and they talk about gods uh, and they talk about, you know, all those mythologies. So they are kind of united within that story. While Neanderthals, even though they're bigger and they're stronger, they lack that communication skill and their society just wasn't as strong and they couldn't form as large of a tribe as the humans. Uh, now, subtext is another important concept. It refers to the gap in knowledge. That's the blank spaces we have in stories, the part that's untold. You know, it's like the tip of the iceberg. The story is the tip and the richness is all about what's underwater. Human imagination is a powerful thing, so we really don't want to explain everything up front. 
And that's certainly true for our concept. You know, don't try to uh, pack every single part of your story into this initial idea. Remember, it's just the seed of the story. So let's take a look at the example that we're going to follow today. Everyone in the world has the ability to read thoughts. Uh, this is pretty interesting, right? Uh, we can see some story components in it. It certainly will have a story, and there seems to be a conflict. Uh, but you know, there there seems to be something that's lacking. Hmm. Well, I think now is much better. Everyone in the world has the ability to read thoughts, except for one person. And by the way, uh. At the bottom of the screen, you'll see a link. That's where I got this idea from. 500 writing prompts to help uh, beat writers down. Uh, you see, by adding this last part, except for one person, we suddenly created a character, a character with potential, an interesting character, who is in the conflict with the entire world. That creates a very interesting story. And What's even better about this high concept is that it's all about subtext. Remember, subtext refers to the gap in knowledge. It refers to how some people would know one thing while other people don't know about that thing. So when some people are able to read thoughts, except for our main character, it's a fertile ground for subtext. All right. Here, we can move up to the next step. Once you have your concept solidly written, you know, keeping in mind of character, conflict, story, and subtext, we can start exploring this idea uh, with a mind map. This is officially the brainstorming stage. If you're unfamiliar with what a mind map is, it's a visual diagram of information specializes in the hierarchy and association between ideas. Uh, so we're going to start with a central idea, you know, uh, at the center of, say, a large piece of butcher paper or a, a poster. Or if you lack any of those, maybe just tape a few pieces of uh, leather-sized paper together uh, and write your central idea in the center. We're going to branch that out uh, and keep asking uh, questions about your idea. This process is known as interrogation. We're going to interrogate our own story until we find out as much detail as we can from uh, this concept. So let's see. Here's our concept that we just came out with. Everyone in the world has the ability to read thoughts except for one person. All right. So let's see. We're going to ask questions. How did this happen? You know, why, how did everybody gain the ability to read thoughts? World, which world? Are we talking about the real world? Or are we going to create a fictional world? What kind of world is it? What kind of thoughts? Uh, you know, are they complete sentences? Or can they go as far as, you know, even reading the vague emotions or even the stream of consciousness, you know, how are they transmitted to the people who read them? Except for one person, okay, well, who is this person, right? That's our hero. Obviously, we have to find out a lot more about him. You see, a lot of times, even seemingly trivial questions can lead to great details. Uh, we're about to follow just this one branch, who is this person, to kind of show you how the process goes. But before we do that, a little detour, I want to introduce you to this concept called the wall of recall. We need to get past the wall of recall. It refers to how when we come up with new ideas, they're often byproducts of the materials we absorb. We're simply recalling the cooler ideas from movies, novels, etc., that we have read or watched before, and we mistake them to be our own. Uh, this is often why we see you know, movie tropes and cliches that just come up over and over again, uh, even, even though some of them are really well used in, uh, in a new concept. 
uh, we're in a new context. Uh, now, it's impossible to completely avoid uh, using existing material. In fact, one of the literary theories of creative writing is that nothing is new. It's always about recreation. Re but still want to try our best to come up with fresh ideas, or at least the fresh combination of ideas. So to get past the wall of recall, a very simple way is to scratch out at least the first three ideas that come to your mind and start with the fourth one, at least three. And also emphasize on scratch them out because just in case you want to use them later, you know, don't black them out or don't, you know, tear them apart and throw in the garbage can or certainly don't delete them if you're on a computer. Uh, so at least you still have that uh, reference to fall back to in case you just can't come up with anything at the moment. So, all right. Equipped with that skill, let's see what we can do here. The interrogation is, who is this person? Well, okay, now we're playing two parts, right? We interrogate, then we have to answer. So we come up with the answer. Uh, well, the, it's a, a son of a great scientist. So turn, you know, this answer suggests that uh, people's ability to, to read thoughts have a sci-fi kind of base. Uh, some, some reason is based in the physics of the universe. Okay, son of a great scientist. But how many times have we seen that? Uh, you know, Spider-Man is just one of the recent, uh, very recent ones, and uh, we really don't need any of that at all. So let's scratch that off. All right, uh, what about this? Just some regular guy or gal. Well, it has potential, you know. Just a regular person who can't read thoughts, that's, that can be interesting. Uh, but even this form of character has been used too often. And besides, it doesn't really answer our question, does it? Because who isn't a regular guy or girl, right? Uh, any sort of ordinary job would fall into this category. Uh, and it's just not a helpful answer to us. Maybe in a way we can keep asking questions based on this answer. Uh, but today, for our instructional purposes, I'm going to scratch that off as well. We're going to go into uh, the next option, maybe a governor. Uh, this one's interesting uh, because the politician characters uh, in literature or in movies, they're often stereotyped. You know, uh, they, when they're the star of the book, they're often some great heroes. Uh, of a thriller book, uh, and when they are side characters, they are often the you know oppressing force. But here we have a politician who cannot lie, and who cannot detect lies. That has some potential there. So we can keep asking questions based on this branch. For instance, if we uh, we ask you know how he came to be, we may come up with the solution that oh hey maybe. This person is not the governor just yet. We're looking at him uh, during his election. And well, so how did the election go? You see, I didn't put every single question on there, but it's implied that there's a question. How did the election go? He lost tragically. Well, that seems to be the logical answer if he's someone who can't read minds, right? So maybe we can scratch that off and try something else. Maybe he won. So how did they win? Maybe he won by pretending that they can read thoughts too. That's an interesting thought. Uh, and here, you know, assuming that I'm, I was actually working on a story, I thought, oh, yes, that's the jackpot. So I uh, get the pen of a different color and circle it out so I don't forget about this later on. But the question doesn't stop there, right? We need to keep asking. If he, has gained some advantage in the election by pretending, then will it ever stop working? Well, we keep answering off that, uh, off that branch. And how does the candidate feel about this, about this uh, you know, pretentious strategy? And of course, we can always go back to previous branches, you know, who are the staff members? Uh, you know, other candidates can read minds of their own voters. All of these are real questions. 
imagine that you have this uh, really picky reader who's just going to tear your novel apart to find out every single loophole in your novel. You have to find out all of these shortcomings before your reader does. Oh, hey, here's a trivial one. Someone who loves vanilla ice cream, that may, come, that may become useful later uh, in this program, that our candidate loves vanilla ice cream. All right. So eventually you will fill up the entire page. It may look something like this. Some of those are scratched out, so some of them are circled, and it may even be denser, you know, if you want to uh, make full use of your paper. Uh, just know that all of the notes you take on your mind map are for yourself. You can use any color, you can use any methods, as long as it's a way to help you organize your thoughts, then it will be helpful to you. Uh, so this kind of this kind of exercise is really uh, to again is to gather as much information as you can during this stage, so that later stages of the brainstorming will be much easier for you to take. All right. As you go through that mind map, at one point, a light bulb may light up for you. And that light bulb is the key question. The key question is the one that the author has to use the entire story to answer. It is also the driving force of the story as well as the driving force for the reader to keep flipping the pages. In other words, the reader really wants to know the answer of the question and the author really wants to explore that question as well. For instance, Will our hero win the election? That may be the key question of our story. Or if it sounds too much like a political thriller, we can also pick a subtler one, such as, will our hero prevail in a world where nothing is secret? But just so you know that if you pick a key question that's a bit more complex or a bit more vague, it may help you, it may not help you as much in later stages. Uh, you know, for instance, the Lord of the Rings, the key question may be, will uh, Frodo be able to destroy the ring? Uh, but as you can see, the, the, the epic is much more complex than just that story. So it's totally fine to have a key question that seems to be uh, kind of simple at first glance. So just to recap, when we're going through the mind map, you have two objectives. One is to find the key question, and the other one is to explore as much details in your story and the world of that story as possible. All right, uh, I'm going to pause right here. Uh, let me see, is there any question that's related to uh, our content so far? So I can't, uh, for some reason, I can't really open up the chat window. Uh, you are good so far, Evan. We're good so far, very good, great. All right, so we're going to go to the next stage in brainstorming, indexing. So at this point, some of you may realize, writing is actually a lot like uh, what we do here at the library. We're basically organizing information. Uh, the library organizes recorded information, resources, you know, books, films, digital databases, uh, and for a writer, this writer needs to organize the information in their head. Mind mapping, why, why do we do the mind mapping? We're creating bridges between ideas so that one can lead to the other. It's just like finding a subject heading and here we go, indexing, right? And that was just the initial step of organization. Right now we're going to take that step even one step further by extracting information from the mind map and into a format that makes more sense to us. What we're going to do during this stage of the brainstorming is to create events. By events, I mean the things that should, that in your mind, the things that should take place in your story. You know, they can be simple things like, oh, the hero and the, and the heroine should uh, kiss at some point for instance, or oh, they should break up at some point. 
or in our in our case, you know, the hero should uh, win the election at some point. We're just going to take all of the details we explored in the mind map and put them into a card. We can use either a sticky note or index card. Uh, in this presentation, I'm going to choose sticky notes because they're they're just really easy to animate. And PowerPoint has them pre-made for me. I can just type in them and the other one is a stock photo. So I'm going to use sticky notes, but that doesn't mean that note cards is by any means inferior. In fact, because you can use both sides of the note card, uh, it may be advantageous in a lot of cases. So uh, pick your own method. The beauty of this step is association. Again, just like uh, a research process in the library. Uh, say, I'm doing a research on uh, modern art, then at the end of that page, at the end of the article, it may have some tags on, say, Picasso or uh, Jackson Pollock. Uh, so, all right, uh, I look at modern art, I thought Picasso may be an interesting uh, subject to further my research, so I click on Picasso, and there you go, at the bottom of that page, it links me to the blue period, uh, and or cubism. One idea links to the other. So here we have to adopt that mindset when we are creating those events. Here on the screen, we see an example. The candidate wins a televised debate. All right. So if that event takes place in our story, then naturally we should have something else. The candidate loses an argument. That should be another event in our story. So that these two events, when they both take place in our story, one can amplify the other. Uh, for instance, in Back to the Future, uh, the main character, I think his name is Marley, I think, uh, when he was in the past, there was a scene in which he, uh, uh, he basically invented rock music. All right? uh, you know, he was singing on stage and all that stuff. So for that scene to make sense, naturally, at the earlier point of that film, there should be a scene that shows that he loves rock music in the present timeline. I hope that makes sense, right? One event uh, should have a partner event, at least a partner event. So let's take a look at, at uh, another example. The candidate almost fires the campaign manager. So, you know, it's a fallout between the hero and the sidekick. If we want this scene to have uh, emotional impact, if we want this to be rich in context, then we really should have another event. Say, you know, earlier on, the candidate and the manager already had a smaller conflict. So it's a buildup. It's not something that came out of the blue. And maybe we want another event related to this too, that they shared a good natured laugh that shows that, you know, the candidate firing the campaign manager really sh shouldn't be something that, ha that happens. Yeah, it should make the readers feel the pain. So again, uh, later I'm going to use an example I showed you guys earlier about how the candidate loves vanilla ice cream. Even something as trivial as that can have another event related to it. Now, I want to pause right here and I want to emphasize this. This is probably the longest stage in your brainstorming. This is the longest stage in your brainstorming because your story is going to be made of events and you want those events to be connected to each other so that the symbols, the themes, and the plot, they would all make sense as an intricate whole. Uh, when you put all of the, these events uh, in your story, you will know exactly how the story will go, and you will know exactly how the characters will develop. So really take your time in this. Uh, you know, it may take months, it may even take years, but it comes back to my earlier point. The more effort you spend in an earlier stage of the brainstorm will save you a lot more time in the later stage of the brainstorm. So definitely do not rush any of those steps. Let's take a look at why we make those cards. 
as we realized, uh, these two sticky notes on the screen, they came from different batches from earlier on, right? Let's go back one. You see these blue ones, they came out together. And those orange ones, they were related. Well, the good thing about them being on sticky notes with cars is that we can rearrange them. The candidate loses an argument and the conflict between the candidate and the manager, doesn't that look very similar? So maybe we can let these two belong in the same scene. And same thing goes for the other ones. You know, for instance, the candidate as a child finds out that everybody else can read thoughts. And in another one of those brainstorming uh, exercises, we found out the candidate loves vanilla ice cream. Well, hey, maybe these two events can be related. Maybe that's how he finds out that he can't read thoughts. It's, it's somehow related to why he loves vanilla ice cream. Uh, and then on the top right, you see a single sticky note. You know, sometimes they are just by themselves, and that's okay. Uh, again, it's a developing process. We can always go back to it and fill in the details. Uh, so if you can't find a partner for it, oh well. Now, these groups of events, when they are put together, they will potentially become the basic unit of a story, which is a scene. Uh, but we're not ready to write that scene just yet. We're not even ready to write the outline of it. All we re need right now is just a simple summarized statement of what these, uh, what this group is. It's, you can almost think of them as a, as a group name. So you see here, Candidate loves vanilla ice cream and Candidate as a child finds out that everyone else can read thoughts. Well, I kind of tweak them a little bit. And here's my statement. At the birthday party, toddler candidate, I'm going to call him that for a little while, so bear with me. Toddler candidate finds out the secret uh, when the hosting mom buys everyone ice cream without asking for preferences. For a toddler, that must have had an impact. And when I came up with this sentence, I realized, hmm, maybe I can replace, maybe I can revise one of my earlier cars, you know. The candidate gags at all ice cream flavors except for vanilla. It's one step further than the previous one of how he just loves vanilla ice cream. I put this one on here to demonstrate that it's always okay to go back and revise an earlier step. Nothing is set in stone. Everything you do here is simply to help you write that story out. And notice that in this statement, I did not bother with the uh, beginning, rising, and finishing of the scene. Uh, we're just not there yet. So, all right, we have a bunch of groups. We have a bunch of group names. And now this next step is very easy. We're simply going to put them into order. You can put them into order uh, in a chronological relationship, or you can put them into order on the narrative relationship. So, you know, if you have a flashback uh, in the middle of the book, feel free to not put that at the beginning of this list. Right? So as you can see, the scene that we just came up with uh, in this example, I just put it in number three of this list. All right, let's see. Uh, again, this one seems to be an easier step, but take your time, find out how uh, it may make the most sense, which one should go first, which one, which one should go uh, later. What's a scene? A scene is a continuous time and space in which characters interact and, you know, things happen. Uh, there are many theories on what a scene should have what, or what a scene should be. Uh, and really, there's no one unified theory. So don't, uh, you know, don't let your head explode by trying to define a scene. But we can find out uh, different theories that may be helpful you uh, that may be helpful to you in thinking about it. Here is how uh, Pulitzer Prize recipient, playwright, screenwriter David Mamet thinks of think about a scene. It should answer three questions: Who what who wants what from whom? What happens if they don't get it? And why now? 
The first question highlights the desire. We want to find out what the character wants. The second question, what happens if they don't get it, shows us the consequence so that readers will care about the outcome. And the third one, why now, creates the urgency. It's the reason that this scene exists and not just you know, a line in the narrative uh, just to tell readers what happened. You know, why do we have to show this scene? Why now? Another helpful way of looking at a scene is through this model. You know, your story will have a status quo. Uh, it will always have a current status. And your characters, uh, they will take actions that inevitably will change the story. So when they take the action, they have some expectations. So a character does something and he is expecting one turnout. But we as the writer, we can't be so nice to the characters. We can't, let, uh, we can't grant their wishes. The moment you grant their wishes, the story ends. So instead, something goes wrong and there's an actual turnout. This actual turnout becomes the new status quo. It's the new current status on which characters have to reassess their decisions and they take another action. And they go to a new expected turnout, but turns out that's not how it happens and we get another gap in reality. Uh, of course, there are exceptions to this. You know, for instance, cliffhanger endings would be an example. But our purpose here today is not to explore these exceptions, but to build a foundation on which you can uh, branch out and explore your writing theory. So uh, maybe take this as a as a foundation and think upon it. Now, understanding what the scene is, we are ready to write an outline. This is the first draft and an outline of a particular scene. The toddler candidate goes to a birthday party at an ice cream shop. The hosting mom buys ice cream for every kid without asking their preferences. And our hero gets confused and asks why. And no one answers because it's such an odd question. You know, everybody knows how to read thoughts. It didn't occur to them that someone couldn't. So our hero looks down at the chocolate ice cream and suddenly starts gagging eventually puking. You know, something about that little toddler's mind just clicked. He realized that this world is against him. Ever since, our hero prefers vanilla flavor because that's the flavor, quote unquote, without flavor. If he chooses vanilla, he can always decide on what kind of syrup to put on later on. So it's a kind of like a defense mechanism. Here's another example. The candidate reveals to the campaign manager that they that uh, this our hero cannot read thoughts, and this is just minutes before the live televised debate. The campaign manager gets mad at our hero, and our hero asks for forgiveness, uh, and you know he's asking for advice so they can succeed at the debate. The campaign manager eventually calms herself and comes up with a strategy unrevealed to the reader for now. We're going to find out in a climax scene where the candidate wins the debate, right? This one kind of follows the Mamet uh, module. The candidate wants support from the manager, right? That's the first question. Second question, uh, what happens if they don't? Well, catastrophe. They're going to lose the debate and probably the election. And why now? Well, the, the debate is starting soon. The scene has to happen. Time to upgrade. We went from a list of narrative or chronological order to an outline, and now it's time for the treatment. The treatment is just a more detailed outline. Uh, basically, if your best friend or relative uh, missed a show and they just want you to describe the show from the first minute all the way to the last, and you just have to do it, and you really love this family member or this, um, this friend, that's what you're doing right now. You're describing the story in detail. It's less work than actually writing it, and it will help you later on. Let's see an example. Uh, and by the way, I'm giving the campaign manager and the uh, our hero uh, stock names uh, because I'm tired of calling them taller candidate and 
uh, campaign manager. So now they are John and Lisa. 20 minutes before going on stage in the break room, Lisa comes over with a binder, rapidly gives John a bunch of final instructions on how to perform during the debate. John seems absent-minded. Lisa finally stops herself and asks why. John does not want to speak, but finally tells the truth that he can't read other people's thoughts. Lisa is, is incredulous at first, but after a few simple tests, she knows that John is not lying this time. Just look at how much more text it is compared to the outline earlier. That outline took a slide. Uh, here, I have a slide that's only maybe like one fourth, one third of the outline. So it's a much more detailed guidance. Now, after you write the treatment for the entire story, the writing process is going to be super easy because you already know exactly how that story will go. From that point on, all you need is to become an artist, you know, to, to have fun with the story, uh, you know, to kind of change the rhythms a bit. And it's a super enjoyable process to write your story when you know where it's going and you will not experience much writer's blocks. But before we start writing that, we're actually not ready because we need to revise. Revise, revise, revise. The more time you spend in the treatment, the less stress you have later when you have a new idea for the story. Uh, and then you have to change all of those carefully crafted uh, dialogue and descriptions uh, and then find out every single one of those loopholes. That's going to be a miserable time. So spend your time in revising your treatment. And by the way, the library has some uh, good information uh, and resources to help you on that process as well. Some of you may be familiar with lynda.com. Uh, we also have RB Digital and Great Courses Collection. A lot of them have resources on creative writing. Uh, this video will be sent to you in the email so you can find the slide uh, and find out how to get there if you're unfamiliar with them. All right, now I do have one last point to make, uh, but before I do, I want to leave a few minutes for questions. Uh, so feel free to, uh, you know, to let me know what kind of thoughts, what kind of concerns or comments you have. If you don't have any questions, here is a list of upcoming programs for you. Those are all adult oriented. Again, you signed up from, excuse me, from our online calendar and go to Zoom registration. Again, I have one last point to make, but let's spend a few minutes on questioning. Oh, I guess it must have done a, a great job. No one has any question. No questions are showing up in the chat right now. Wow. Okay. You know, I guess, uh, hmm. yeah, I'm just going to dust, you know, put all this dust off my shoulder. I guess that was being uh, pretty comprehensive. And uh, don't worry, if you have questions, it's never too late to ask them. I'm going to... Uh, Go ahead and finish the presentation, but we may have a few minutes uh, after that for, uh, for everybody. All right, so what do we do with all this information? Uh, you know, as you can see, it's a rigorous process, and right? we start with just one concept, a seed of the story, and we went all the way to, uh, to the treatment, which in itself is almost the complete product. So why are we doing this? Well, you see, uh, among all the uh, uh, writer's manual that I've read, I've came across this this analogy that I find uh, that I find very useful. Uh, you know, we all have great ideas, and we're eager to show that idea to the world. So it's like, you know, we see a mountain far away, and we point at that, and we say, "Hey, you know what? I had a vision. There's gold in that mountain." So we point at the mountain, we yell at everybody, hey, everybody, look, I found gold. But of course, no one's going to pay attention to that. It, it sounds like crazy talk. No one's going to believe that. So what we do is that we go to that mountain ourselves. You climb it, put on your gears, get a bucket, you get your hands dirty and your clothes torn because you know the gold is there. And you're going to show all those naysayers, you know, that you are right after all. And finally, you do succeed. 
you find the gold. You came back from the long journey and you show everybody the bucket of gold in your hand. The end. Except people are still not paying attention to you. It's not because you didn't work hard enough. It's because you ended your work before the real end. There are a lot of brilliant people in the world uh, and all of them have golden ideas and all of them went through that hard work and mistook that as the end. But you have to take the next step, which is crafting. You know, you have all those gold ore that you have melted, but they are not going to become something that people can marvel at until you carefully craft them and polish them into the best possible version of your idea, the best possible version of your story. Among the thousands and millions of people yelling for attention, uh, you know, with their muddy shoes and gloves and their bucket of raw gold, you are the only one holding a carefully crafted object of art. So you don't need to yell. In fact, you hardly need to speak and people will come at you and marvel at your work. So thank you very much, everybody, for coming here to our program today. That's our program.